I never would have seen it approaching. My world broke with one chat at 11 years old. Mom and Dad sat me in our living room, looking austere. Dad started, his voice abnormally steady. Dakota, we need to talk. I recall wondering why this cannot be excellent. My gut knotted up like this. Mom let out a long breath. You father and I are divorcing each other. The words strike me like a gut-tastic punch. Divorce-minded? Still, they never engaged in fighting. To one another, they were always polite. Yes, we hadn't gone on family trips recently, but divorce, what then? Why? Asks I stammered and tears started to fill my eyes. Dad opened his mouth to cough. We have both come across others we wish to be with. Mom grabbed my hand, but I turned aside. Sweetheart, we will still be in your life. You will just live with each of us at different times. The next several days passed in a haze. I saw Dad load his belongings, stuffing bits of our lives together into cardboard boxes. Mom was busy redoing as though it would be simpler if Dad disappeared. Then arrived the day Mom's new boyfriend moved in. He came with a kid a few years younger than mine and a truck loaded with stuff. Mom greeted them with a too happy voice. Dakota, this is Tom and his daughter, Lily. I mustered a grin, hoping perhaps this wouldn't be too horrible. One might find fun a sister. Lily searched me both up and down, her lips slightly curved in a smile. Nice to meet you, she murmured, her voice implying everything but... I visited Lily trying to befriend her the following day. I volunteered to show her my toy and book favorites. She let her eyes roll back. Look, let us clear one thing first. We are not sisters and we are not going to be buddies. You simply exist in the way. I watched Mom spend days loving Lily. She bought new outfits, complimented her often, and even handed some of my old toys. One evening I listened in on Mom and Tom talking about colleges. Mom advised Lily to register at Westbrook Academy. It is the best in the neighborhood. Regarding Dakota, what about? Tom probed. Mom said, Dakota's doing fine at her current school, after a pause. Lily, well, she is brilliant. She requires more of a challenge. Slunk back to my room, the words kept running in my thoughts. Lily was blessed. I was just fine. Weeks stretched into months and I grew more and more uncomfortable. Mom and Tom were building their ideal small family and I was the strange one out. That day at last arrived for me to see Dad. I loaded my suitcase with both enthusiasm and nervousness. Perhaps at his new location things would be better. Dad picked me up in his car and we drove in uncomfortable quiet. At the door greeted us Dad's new wife, Sarah. She wore a false smile and long blonde hair, less than Mom. Welcome, Dakota, she remarked with too cheerful voice. I hope you will find this comfortable here. Nodding unsure of what to say, the flat smelt of strange spices and incense. Sarah showed me a little room I would be using on trips. Sarah was boiling some sort of tea in the kitchen early the next morning. Want to try some? She asked. It is a unique combination from Tibet, really spiritual. I swallowed reluctantly. It had an odd and harsh taste. My throat began to itch minutes later, then burned. I started to cough and battled to breathe. Dad, says I gasped, terror starting in my chest. Sarah, her eyes expanded. Oh, cut back on your theatrical behavior. It is only tea. Still, I could not quit coughing. My eyesight darkened, and I sensed myself drowning on dry ground. Sarah, call an ambulance. Dad yelled, his voice muted and remote. She is faking it, Sarah argued. Dakota, this behavior driven by attention has to stop. I was not able to reply. All around me, the earth was turning dark. Rising from a hospital bed with an oxygen mask on my face comes next. Dad arrived looking pale and concerned. You experienced a strong allergic reaction, he said. The doctor said if we waited any more, 
Although he didn't finish the phrase, he wasn't obliged to. Sarah's rejection of me nearly caused me to die. We went to Dad's flat when I got out of the hospital. Sarah stood waiting, her arms crossed. She stated coldly, I believe Dakota would be better off not staying here going forward. She's too troublesome. Dad looked at me sure he would defend me, but he simply stood there, silent and defeated. There was silence on the drive back. Dad said nothing as I waited for him to apologize and swear he would make things right. Not thinking about bidding farewell to Dad, I entered the house. Mom hardly turned from her magazine. She remarked, sounding almost angry, You're back, Clyde. Silently headed to my room, shutting the door behind me. Alone, really alone, I had no idea how to make it right. The next several weeks passed as a haze of uncertainty and loneliness. Lily kept torturing me at home, breaking stuff and blaming me for it. She knocked over a vase one day, sending flowers and water pouring across the floor. Mom, she screamed, Tom, Dakota destroyed your preferred vase. Tom walked in before I could defend myself. That's it, young woman. He started to growl at me. See your room, not budgeted this month for the damage. Mom nearly shook her head, disappointment obvious on her face. I stared at her silently begging her to believe me. Tears flooding my face as I sat in my room. I knew I had to get away. At that, I thought of Grandma, Dad's mother. She had always been friendly to me, taught at the nearby college, and lived alone. She might be able to help. Grandma's residence felt as though one were entering another planet. I felt a weight come off my shoulders the instant I entered her door. Her place smelt like freshly made cookies mixed with dusty literature. It was small, with shelves of books and plush chairs. How about we have some tea and you tell me what's going on? Grandma advised, which sent me to the kitchen. I felt safe enough to let it all pour forth for the first time in months. I told her everything, the divorce, mom's new family, dad's desertion, the episode at his flat. Grandma listened calmly, her gentle eyes never turned away from my face. She grabbed my hand as I was finishing. Oh, Dakota, I regret you have been going through all this by yourself. You are here whenever you so want. You always find my door open. Grandma's house turned became my haven that day on. I began to spend increasing amounts of time there. We would labor in her yard, cook together, and, above all, read books from her enormous collection. Grandma said, How are your grades, Dakota? One evening as we were seated in her study. I sighed. All right, I suppose. Mom these days is more concerned about Lily's homework. Grandma's eyes narrowed. Well, that won't do. How about helping you with your academics? Our after-school tutoring sessions started then as well. As it happened, Grandma was a really outstanding teacher. Stories and real-world examples helped her to bring even the most boring topics alive. I was staying over Grandma's more frequently as the weeks went by. It started out only weekends at first, then a few evenings a week. I was virtually living there full-time before I knew it. The odd thing was, Mom and Dad appeared to overlook. Mom would ask absentingly, Oh, were you at your father's? When I returned home. When I saw Dad, on the occasional visits, he would presume I had been with Mom. Things came to a head on one of these visits to Grandma's. Grandma looked anxious when I got home from school. Dakota, she murmured, her voice grave. Today there were some guardianship service attendees from your school. My heart shot. What? Why? Grandma yawned. Mrs. Johnson, your teacher, visited your mother's house to go over shifting you to a class for gifted children. Your mother answered she was living with your father when she inquired where you were. When Mrs. Johnson called your father later, he indicated you were living with your mother. She knew neither of them knew where you really was. I slumped into a chair legs wobbly at once. What is going to happen now? Grandma said, 
The guardianship service has authorized you to stay with me for now, but they will sue to ascertain your official place of residence. I could hear Grandma on the phone that evening, lying in bed at her house, her voice low and strong. She was on my side, babbling. Someone was putting me first, and for the first time in a long time I noticed. The courtroom was frightening, all polished wood and austere faces. As I settled in, Mom and Dad were seated on opposing sides and neither met my eyes. Last year's divorce of my friend, Jesse's parents kept me thinking about it. Desperate to have Jesse live with them, they had battled furiously over who would gain custody. The judge, a stern-looking woman wearing glasses on her nose, called the session to order. We are here today to decide Dakota Miller's living quarters, she said. The next event seemed out of a dream. My parents started battling to get rid of me rather than over me. She ought to live with her mother. Red on his face, Dad yelled. I recently started a new family. There is nowhere for her in our house. Mom got to her feet, her voice sharp. You do not, oh no, you know, I too lead a life. I am not expected to look after her full time. Stunned, I sat there while my parents fought over who more none wanted. Though I refused to allow tears flow from my eyes, they burned there. I wouldn't let them experience the gratification of knowing how badly they were damaging me. The gavel of the judge dropped firmly. She yelled, order, silencing my worried parents. She came to me, her eyes softening just a little. Dakota, I really regret you are experiencing this. Not trusting myself to talk, I nodded. That's when Grandma's voice emerged clearly and powerfully, and I heard a chair scrape behind me. She said, tall despite her age, Your Honor, if I may speak. Grandma went on. The judge nodded. Dakota's parents clearly neither are ready or able to provide her the house she is due. More than ready to assume full custody of her, I am her grandmother. She went to the bench and turned over some paperwork. These documents demonstrate my financial consistency. At Westfield College, I am a lecturer with a solid pay and sizable savings. More importantly, I love Dakota and want to provide her the steady, caring home she requires. Examining the papers, the judge nodded slowly. She turned then to face me. Dakota, you are 14 now and old enough to be involved in this choice. Whose house would you prefer to share? My leg quivering slightly, I got up. Mom and Dad gazed at me, clearly relieved at the thought of being free of me. Standing on the porch of my childhood house, which today felt strange to me, I discovered myself. Her face set in a mask of mother delight. My mother opened the door. She had tears in her eyes, well made for maximum impact. Her husband, Tom and Lily, my stepsister stood behind her putting on smiles that fell short of their view. Dinner's dinner was tense in terms of discourse. My mother kept complaining about how tough things had been recently. The house is just falling apart, she said sharply. The roof needs replacing, the plumbing is a headache, and poor Lily desperately wants to go to a decent college, but with our finances. I feigned not to notice the pointed glances and nervous signals. I inquired about their lives, their jobs, and seemed to be interested while they stammered through answers, obviously not ready for a real conversation. At last, my mother turned to face me, her eyes false with imitation concern. And you, Dakota, how have things? Over these years, what have you been doing? I grinned, resolved to challenge her. Oh, I have been doing very nicely. Right now, I am a last-year college student. Do you know, by the way, where I am studying or what I am studying? Her face turned a shade of drained color. In their chairs, Tom and Lily moved uneasily. My mother stammered, I, well, that is. It's okay, Mom, I said, my voice quiet but firm. You are not obliged to pretend. You are interested in my inheritance. You are not interested in me. The front came apart right away. The face of my mother twisted with guilt and wrath. 
Tom started to object while Lily said something under her breath. Now, Dakota, my mother said, her voice stern. That's unfair. Our family is this. Simply said, we are seeking to reconnect. No, I said, cutting her off and standing. Not family is what we are. Families do not abandon one another. Family does not ignore one another for years and then only get involved when money is involved. I moved towards the door, their objections ignored. I heard their yells behind me as I emerged into the cool evening air, but I turned not back. I felt thinner with every stride. Freeder. A few days after the terrible meal with my mother, I was standing at my father's door. The house was smaller than I had recalled, with paint flaking in several areas. When my father came to answer the door, his expression combined false warmth with surprise. Dakota, he continued, drawing me in. Good to see you. Inside I came upon Sarah, my stepmother. Her greeting to me came out as harsh. Hi, Coda. Welcome. Such a long time has passed. Curious, a small child peeked out from behind Sarah's back. I realized, starting with my half-brother. About eight years old, he was a living reminder of how much time had gone by. My father, stroking the boy's hair, said, This is Michael. Say hello to your sister, Michael. Michael simply watched, obviously perplexed by my unexpected presence in his life. The discussion was tense as we sat in the living room. My father catched his voice clearly. Dakota, we have been considering this. Michael here is rather intelligent. We would prefer him sent to Westbrook Academy. Although this is a reputable institution, the cost. This was where I could see things headed. I concluded for him and you thought I might be willing to pay for it. My father looked ashamed, quite decent. Well, you see, with your inheritance. Mother, I broke off, my tolerance running thin. Why just now are you remembering me? Why did you not call my birthdays, my high school graduation, or my starting of college? Sarah burst in, her voice shrill before my father could reply. Now pay close attention, young woman. Our family is here. You owe us this kind of aid. Should you fail, we will bring you before court and seek our half. Not able to control it, I laughed. Once I had cooled myself, I answered, actually, according to the law, we are not family. You both dropped off on me. Legal guardians for me were grandma. You are not entitled to anything. Their expressions were pale, then rapidly changed to reflect rage. Though my father began to stammer, I was already walking towards the door. I glanced one final time at Michael as I turned away. He seemed perplexed and a little depressed. I could relate to him. None of this was his responsibility. My phone was vibrating nonstop over the next three days with messages from both of my parents. They sought to guilt me, begged, threatened. My mother sent an especially scary note about approaching debt-related homelessness. None of it got through to me. Rather, I concentrated on my forthcoming college graduation and future goals. Looking at my financial balance and realizing Grandma left a legacy, I became responsible. This presented an opportunity to actually change things and create the life Grandma had always wanted for me. But when I considered my future, Michael kept returning to me. At all of this, he was innocent, just a child trapped at the crossroads of adult issues. Though I had no intention of sending money to my father or stepmother, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a way Michael might be helped going forward. That was something to give thought. Still, for now I had my own road to follow. I was excited as I sat at my desk investigating employment possibilities and investment options. The planet opened out to me in a manner it never had done. 